All right, serious and silliness. Outcasts have a return. Uh, James, I want to pronounce your last name right. Mooch DeLoretto, is that right? Yeah, DeLoretto. DeLoretto. Okay, sorry about that. But everybody calls you Mooch. Correct. So last time you were on, we had a pretty good interview, and uh, a lot of people saw it. But this time, it's a little bit different because uh, you wrote a book, and I wanted to have you on and talk about talk about this book. So the book awesome. is called The Right of My Life and Memoir, Justin Mooch DeLoretto. What, um, what made you write the book? Um, well, so... I started doing that kind of podcast stuff. You know, I had my own YouTube channel That's right. and I think we talked about it briefly before, but my goal of my YouTube channel was to kind of tell my story, but also, you know, how it intersected with uh, other people. So I'd have some guests on like the singer from my band and, but it was all, it was all stuff that, you know, I'd done in my youth or, or ha- had to do with motorcycle club stuff. And there was a lot of interest in, you know, just things I've done and, and kind of my story. And um, when I was, in Oregon, I'd, you know, I'd been arrested a few times back in the club days. And there was this one journalist who was the main one that was covering all my stories. And he had gotten out of journalism, and started writing books. And so he had mentioned us potentially doing a book. And so, you know, I just started thinking about it, um, deciding if it was something I wanted to do. I was no longer in the club, so there was no rules that I couldn't do it. So there was really nothing, no reason not to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, uh it was kind of a difficult process initially with this author because he had a lot of other stuff going on and he does like a lot of true crime type stuff. And then he started getting into fiction. So he didn't really have a ton of time. And so my friend Tom DeBlass had a book out. He's like a big name jujitsu guy from out there by you. He's in out of New Jersey mm-hmm. and he he has a memoir out. So I was just kind of picking his brain about, you know, what the process was like. How did it go for him? And uh, he just hooked me up with it with his publishing company. He was like, hey, here's the publicist. Maybe they'd be interested in your story. So we did a meeting and they offered me a book deal and we hit the ground running. OK, very cool. Very cool. How are sales going? Because it, re- it only recently came out, what, a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, it came out on the 7th. So I don't have access to like the actual numbers yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, Amazon does like the different rankings and it, it's been uh, number one in motorcycles category. It was number one in social work category. It changes hourly. Um, right. But it's been it's been right up there pretty high. The highest it's been out of all books, which is like 150,000 books or something. It's been it was at a thousand. Um, wow, so I think, you know, it sounds like it's doing really well. It definitely sounds like it's doing really well. So for those of you that those are people that haven't seen our former interview or uh, your YouTube, why don't you give a breakdown about um, how you got into the biker clubs, biker culture, and then how you got away from it? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I, I grew up with an identical twin brother um, and, and I, we've talked about it before, but, you know, I think I kind of had a search for identity. So, so growing up, you know, I was on a lot of team sports, did a lot of wrestling um, from there. I got into like the punk rock hardcore scene and ended up joining like an anti-racist skinhead gang. And I spent several years doing that. Um, and then when I first started riding motorcycles, man, I, I was hooked. Um, I loved motorcycles. I loved riding. I started riding with people and going on road trips um, and I've just always kind of been that guy that if I'm, if I'm doing it, I want to be in the best group there is out there. So, um, I started hanging out with clubs and kind of moved my way through a few clubs until I, I got into the Mongols, which ended up being a really good fit for me and a club that I really enjoyed. And I ended up being in for close to 15 years. I, I retired just after 14 years mm-hmm. of active membership. I was in leadership for a little over or like national leadership for a little over 10. Um, so I stayed pretty active in that club life. And then, you know, towards the end, I think generations, you know, I talk about it towards the end of my book, but, you know, generations are changing and the club, the landscape and clubs are changing. Um, and it just started to feel my heart wasn't as into it as it used to be. And I was thinking there was a lot of po- club politics going on. There had been a national leadership change and it just kind of felt, felt like the time to step away. Um, you know, I, I had I had spent a lot of time in the club. I felt like I did a lot for the club. I had a really good time and I enjoyed all my time in the club. But it wasn't really aligning with my values and morals anymore. Um, you know, in in that time, I'd gotten a master's degree in social work, and I'd really gotten into becoming a mental health therapist. And I work with at risk youth that are on parole or probation. So um, I was really kind of diving more into into my work and my career. I, you know, I got married um, two years ago, and so that right, I was right around the time I left the club too. And so there was just the focus of my life kind of shifted. You know. Okay. Now you were not always in in the Mongols. There was a, a previous. A club you were in as well right yeah so when i first started coming around motorcycle clubs i was hanging out with a local club in portland called the outsiders um i ended up prospecting for them but i ended up moving to nevada for work and and to get just to get out of oregon in general 
Um, and when I got to Nevada, I joined a club called the Vagos, okay. which um, they're a pretty well-known major club now. At the time, they were still well-known. They were bigger, but they weren't as big as they are now. Mm -hmm. um, and I spent close to two years with them. And I, I just think I probably jumped in too quick. I was a young, impulsive kid. And I, they had like the outsiders and, and the bikers I'd seen in Oregon were like uh, older guys, like a different generation than me. Right. And, and I was really enamored with club world stuff. So I kind of looked past it. I was just like, wow, this is crazy. These dudes are club guys. This is cool. Right, right, but right. I, I also got to that point where I looked around and I was like, man, other than like this club, I don't have a lot of common with these guys. Like we're of different eras. We listen to different music. We're interested in different things. They're not people I probably, and with all due respect, but they're not people I probably would have been friends with outside of club world. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I met the Vagos, there was a lot of younger guys. A lot of them were like skateboarders and ex-punk rockers. And most of their focus was riding motorcycles and having a good time. So we had, so I was drawn in pretty quick. You know, I was like, yeah, oh, right. I didn't know this existed. Or here's, you know, this, this big club and it's people closer to my age and we're just riding and partying and, and you know, everything you would think about when you think of motorcycle clubs. Mm -hmm. Um, so I jumped in without knowing a lot about them and I spent two years in it. And, and although I had some good times in there and met some really good people, the leadership of the club and the politics of the club was not something um, that I agreed with. And so I decided it was, you know, it wasn't the club for me. And as mm -hmm. I was doing that, I was spending more, more and more time with some Mongols and I'd met some Mongols and just seemed to hit it off better with them. And so I, I patched over to join the Mongols. And then, like I said, I ended up staying with them for almost 15 years. Oh, wow. Okay. When you originally prospected for the Mongols, I mean, I apologize for the outsiders. Did that, did you have to prospect for each and every club you were in? Or, no, uh, I only prospected for the outsiders okay. um, and, and never made it to full patch. Like I said, I'd moved before. Really? Okay. Yeah, because I, I wasn't in long enough to get there. Like I'd, I'd hung around for a while, then I prospected for a couple months, but then I, mo I was moving. Um, and when I moved for work, they, they put me on what they called like an inactive prospect status, which I, I don't think is necessarily a thing. But what, what they were saying was, you know, you're moving for work. So if you decide to come back, you can pick up where you left off. So I still had some ties to them and they had uh like some some other because they were like a really old school club from the 60s mm -hmm. they didn't claim to be one percenters at the time um but there's like a network of old school clubs that stick together you know because they're all been around forever they're not major clubs they're not everywhere so they you know do a lot of events and runs and parties together okay and they had some friends down there in nevada that they'd asked me to hook up with or link up with and that's what kind of brought me back into that scene in nevada too Okay. Um, but when I joined the Vagos, I was actually offered a full patch, A, because I'd already prospected for a club, even though I didn't make it. And B, it was a, a charter member of a new chapter. So the, the Reno chapter was splitting and Carson starting a chapter called Border Town. Mm -hmm. And so it was essentially coming in as a as a charter member. So you know, it was kind of skirting the rules essentially, but I was coming in so that way I came in without prospecting. And then with, with the Mongols, um, it was a direct patch over as well. And it was also the same thing. I was I was starting in a new state. There was no other Mongols in Oregon. There was no Mongol chapters in Oregon when we started. So there was really no one to prospect for, essentially. Um, ah, okay. And then I, I came in with the, Mo the Mongols have a thing called a, a P patch or probationary patch. And they'll do it like if you're starting a new chapter or just for different reasons. But um, so it's it's not the same as prospecting, but you're a probationary member for a year. So you still don't have the full privileges of a full patch member. Um, you know, you're not being ran like a prospect, but you know, you're still helping at events and, you know, doing security and stuff like that. So although I wasn't a prospect, I was still a probationary member for a year when I first okay. came in. Can you discuss what prospecting was like for the outsiders? Yeah, man. So it, it was actually a pretty cool experience. So it, I didn't know anything about that world. Right. And I think a lot of people that don't, they think prospecting is like, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, bitch work, right? You hear all this, like they're getting talked down to and running errands and, you know, all these types of things. And so I really wasn't sure to ex what to expect. Um, the Outsiders are a really righteous club. They're very old school, but they're very about brotherhood. And they have a rule where there's nothing two brothers can't sit down and work out. So they're not allowed to fight each other. So they're, they're not abusing their prospects in that manner. And I, I think the goal was, what I, or at least from what I saw, the goal was to be teaching the history and the protocol of the club, not to humiliate somebody. Um, you know, there would be times where they'd have you do push-ups or, you know, just silly, like, historical stuff, right? Like fraternity style stuff. Right, right. But right. no one would ever ask you to do anything illegal or anything like that. It was mainly helping out. So, like, I worked uh, from 7 to 4 during the day. And as soon as I got off work, I'd go down to the clubhouse and check in. Usually mop the floors, clean, wipe down the bar, you know, check the bar stock. 
And then if there was a member there or when members started showing up after work, you know, I'd serve them drinks, empty the ashtrays. And then if they wanted to go ride, I'd hop in the pack and go ride and stand outside and do security or sometimes I'd go inside and run security um, mm-hmm. until you got cut loose. But that was a daily thing. You know, you'd, you'd either hang out there until they someone said, hey, we're, no one's going out tonight. Go ahead and go home. Or if the guys are going out, you go out until they say, hey, it's time to go home. Um, and then when they had, you know, events and parties, you're, you're mainly working the bar or, or security out front, um, you know, running trash out, stuff like that. So, you know, you're, you're responsible for carrying stuff that anybody might need. So like breakdown kit, tools, cigarettes, lighters, um, so that, you know, someone could say, prospect, you got a lighter or, you know, so so it was more of like a, you're, you're proving your worth, but you're also learning the history and protocol of the club. So a lot of the times the older members would sit down and say, oh, do you know why you're supposed to be doing this because of this or, you know, or we'd visit other clubhouses and, and an old school member would tell me about the history with that club and um, how to act in clubhouses. So it was a really big learning experience more than it was like a fraternity hazing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I didn't see a lot of it in the Vagos necessarily because I don't think, you know, I was only in for two years, but the Mongols were very, very similar. Um, and especially when I got into leadership, um, my goal was the whole point of prospecting should be to teach somebody something, Right. And, and you want the best guy for the job. So if we're wanting to get well-respected, you know, the local tough guys or the guys from the local street gangs or whatever, but if, if you're wanting to get these well-respected dudes that already have a reputation for themselves, they're not going to want to come in and get treated like a bitch for lack of better terms, you know, right, or they're right, not right. going to. Um, so that's not the goal. The, anything that we were asking prospects to do should be, there should be a reason for it. It should be teaching them something or they're helping out by like, you know, running and grabbing cigarettes or doing a beer run at the store or whatever. So they're either helping to prove their worth or, you know, we're teaching them something. There's a, there's a reason they're doing it. So mm-hmm. a lot of prospecting was, was that just kind of under, you know, learning about the club life, learning about club protocol, how to address other patch holders, how to address other clubs. Security is a huge thing, learning how security works. Um, so it's mainly a proving ground. Like it's a chance to learn, is this a good fit for me? Is it a good fit for the club? Do I fit in with these guys? Um, I would say the biggest challenge to that stuff is that, you know, you have to be available 24 seven. Someone can call you and say, Hey, we're going out and you got to go. Um, but a big misconception of that too, is it's the same when you're a patch holder, really. So a lot of times you'd get these prospects be like, Oh, I just can't wait to get my patch thinking they're going to have some sort of downtime. And they realize hey, it's no different once you get your patch. <laughs> yeah. You still got to be there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How old were you when you prospected? Um, I think I was about 25, 24, 25. It seems like a young man's uh, game, if that makes sense. Because I'm 47. I'm thinking to myself, I wouldn't want to fucking do that shit. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, and you know, I think it's a little different nowadays because, you know, early years, it was all young kids doing this stuff, right? Like you look back in the 60s and 70s, these were all, you know, early 20s guys doing it or guys coming back from the war, but they weren't, you know, in their 40s. Um, right. And then there's a whole generation of older bikers, right? Which was that generation I first started coming around. So there was a lot of 40 and 50 year old prospects, but I think it's kind of shifted back towards a lot more 20 and 30 year old guys are getting into it. You know, it's kind of popular. It's popular in culture right now. Um, But yeah, I mean, as a prospect, ideally it's the best done when, you know, you don't have kids and a wife. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, right. right. Obligations. Now, if you do, that's a perfect time to find the balance to say, Hey, is this club for me? Can I balance my club life? And, also be a good dad and, and, you know, a good, good husband. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's, there, obviously there's two sides to it, but yeah, it's definitely a lot. It's a lot easier when you're just a single guy in your twenties and you're just like, Oh, we want to go to the bar. Oh yeah. We're going out. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That would make sense. Absolutely. Why do you think there's a resurgence with the younger generation? Well, I think it's been back to being popular and mainstream media is a big one. You know, there's all the TV shows and um, you know, so it's, it's kind of like the cool hip thing. I think, you know, motorcycles have started to be cool again in in different scenes. You know, there's a lot of these born free and these big, like these big events that are going on that are kind of like hipster type events. Um, So I just think culturally, it's kind of like resurgence Mm -hmm. and, you know, people are always looking for something to do and and people to ride with. And I just think the more popular motorcycles get, then people are going to want to become in clubs. And then club life's been so glorified all over TV and, and the internet these days that I think it's just drawn more people into it. Yeah, I agree, but I'm going to I'm going to throw another theory at you and I want to know if you agree. There's been a huge pushback to the feminization of the country if you will. There has been podcasters and authors and YouTubers saying no 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 no, it's okay to be a man. It's good to be a man. It's good to be part of a a a, a 
a group of guys and, and, and have guy time. And it's been this huge pushback. And I mean, you can, you know, from obviously the biggest one is um, uh, the guy who just got arrested in Romania. Yeah. Andrew Tate, obviously. And, and, and I think he is a reaction to the, you know, feminization of, you know, the country where it's like, no, you don't need to be, you know, you need to be stoked. You need to be a man, so on and so forth. Do you think that has anything to do? Because when you think of biker clubs, you think of the most masculine, toughest, righteous guys possible. Do you think that has anything to do with that? I think that definitely plays a role. And, and, you know, a lot of the rules in all motorcycle clubs is what more old school men are going to say that's man stuff, right? Like be a man of your word, show up on time, look a man in his eyes when you shake his hands. Don't, don't be disrespected. Never call another man a bitch. Like, you know, stuff where it shouldn't be new to you. Right. These Like we look at those rules are like, Oh yeah. I mean, if, if, if you're a righteous person, you've probably been living your life like this anyways. And so, yeah, I think it probably has that appeal. I would say the negative side to it is, you know, we're also now in a generation of uh, people calling cops, pressing charges, um, able to talk shit on the internet with no repercussions. Um, a lot of people that are too scared to get punched in the face. So they pull a gun or whatever. I just think that generation has changed. So I think there's a lot of people joining motorcycles clubs as well to say, Hey, do you know who I am? Puffy chested, Mm. um, which is the negative side of that masculinity stuff you talk about, right? Like they're doing it because it it gives them an image that they've wanted, but they probably have never earned where I think in the earlier eras, when a guy that joined, you know, one of the major motorcycle clubs, he was likely the local tough guy in town already had a reputation. People knew who he was. You know what I mean? You know, everyone had that neighborhood guy that kind of already had a rep and everyone's like, Oh "Oh, yeah. mess with That guy. That's usually the guy that stepped up and joined one of those major clubs. Um, and now, because, you know, for whatever reason over the years, motorcycle clubs just kind of started being in a race for membership and, and expansion. And, you know, there's a bunch of different reasons for that. But I think it started becoming where if you're willing to do what they ask, whether it's prospecting or whatever, they'll essentially take anybody or at least not every chapter, but most clubs. And we get a lot of these guys that don't understand that type of stuff, but they want the image that comes with it. They want that masculine tough guy image, but they're not that guy. So it's kind of a catch yeah. 22, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, you know, uh, I've I've noticed that too. Uh, it's when you were in the club life, did you have? How can I explain this? Did you have those guys that were basically would throw down at any second, as well as the guys that were masculine but reasonable, or was everybody a psycho? Because uh, the reputation of one percent motor clubs is everybody's a lunatic, right? And no, I mean, you, you can't have a bunch of lunatics and still be on the streets without at least a couple reasonable minds, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think at least, it, it, you know, I, I can't speak to the earlier eras, but in my era, um, especially early on, I think everyone had a, a, a piece of being a lunatic in them. But like for, <laughs> yeah. for me, you know, coming from the punk rock and skinhead scene, we were fighting and stuff all the time. And actually being in a club calmed me down or slowed me down because I had to realize if I, if I start shit in this bar, if I react to this guy violently in this bar... I'm putting all my brothers at risk too. Um, not just that, but when you're not wearing a patch and you get in a bar fight and you leave, you're likely not being looked for or wanted. It's whatever, but you do it with a patch on and it's a big federal charge and there's a man, you know what I mean? It, it just ends uh, up turning into a way bigger yeah. thing. So it really, it, you really have to think through the repercussions of your actions before you mm-hmm. just react. Um, and so, you know, I, I think there's always those guys that can handle business but I think people have gotten smarter about how they do it. Or at least I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but there, I think there's also usually someone in leadership that's going to have that rational mind of, okay, is this worth it? You know, what's the outcome? What do we want to get out of this? And what are the repercussions? I've always said when we've had to do stuff like that, what's the, what's risk versus reward, right? Is this going to be worth what could possibly happen? Um, and, you know, if you, if you can do something that's low risk and high reward, let's get after it. Um, and then there's sometimes those times where it's super high risk and the reward's not much, but maybe we, we feel like it needs to happen. Um, but just someone actually is able to think stuff like that through before we just react and, you know, get it, put everybody at risk of being shot or going to prison. Right. Right. Now, when you finally got to, uh, the Mongols, what was the biggest difference? Cause <clears throat> for the people that don't know, Mongols is one of the, one of the biggest clubs in, in the world, basically. Right. It's the top well, top four, top five in, in the world, or at least in the country, from what I understand. What was the major difference from going to the smaller clubs to that? Well, so 
I think there was pros and cons to both. Like the outsiders, they only had two chapters, um, but they were super, super tight knit. So you want to talk brotherhood? Well, these guys all knew each other inside and out where everybody lived. Well, you know, they spent all their time together, both chapters. So there was, you know, even though the chapters were a couple hours apart, there was a club event. There were, there were the only two chapters. So they were always doing stuff together. So I think that was a huge plus, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Vagos were a bigger club. They also had a rule that you couldn't fight each other. But as I, what I did see is with the bigger clubs, sometimes there's, you know, power struggles and in, internal stuff like that. Or uh, this chapter doesn't like that chapter, even if it didn't turn into fighting. It's just, you know, it, it kind of undermined some of the brotherhood. But um, the biggest thing, and I guess what I liked most about the Mongols was it was the only club that I'd been around that the focus was truly on brotherhood. What can we do for each other? So like in Oregon, when we eventually had four or five chapters, even though we did our meetings individually, any events we went to, or if we were bar, whatever, we did everything collectively. So instead of being like, oh, this was Salem chapter, we pretty much were, this was Oregon, right? Like we mm. all ran together. We, we, you know, if we went to national runs or rides out of state, we were always together. It wasn't like, oh, Salem chapters going to Idaho and Eugene chapter says, I'll meet you there. Or, we'll meet up along the way. Or, or if we're passing other chapters, we'll stop by and pick them up and we'll roll in one big group. So the Mongols were really, really good as far as like working together, strength in numbers, unity type of thing. Like, and, and because of that, I think that propelled the brotherhood, right? Because we're doing this for each other. This isn't just me. This isn't just my chapter. This is for the group. This is for the, we all have the same top rocker and the bottom one isn't as relevant. Um, uh, and and okay. I can't speak for other clubs. I don't know if they're like that or not, but, but I didn't see that, but I definitely saw it in the Mongols. And I would say that was one of the biggest differences to me is that, you know, it was a big major club, but when we got together, it was still like family. There was no, I never went to a Mongol event or a Mongol party and had to be like, man, I, you know, I hope I, I'm safe here. Like it was right, 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 comfortable. Right. You could, you know, once you got to know everybody, you could bring your old, your wife or whoever, and she was comfortable. And um, it was a bit, it's a big family, you know? So I think that, that was, was really cool. And that's what really promoted the whole brotherhood. We're all in this together, you know, and, and when you're in it together, you're willing to do what you got to do for each other. Do you think that's possibly the appeal for the young generation too? Because, you know, uh, being part of a unit uh, or community or family is basically non-existent anymore. It's very, unless you come from a very, very traditional background, like maybe Arabic or, or Asian or something like that. But, um, there's a lot of uh, young kids, young men that are basically lost and they don't know what it's like to be part of a brotherhood. Do you think that's appealing? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that's what drew me to it. And, you know, I, I, like I talked in the book and I think we might have talked about four too, is I come from a really good sized tight knit Italian family. I had family, mm -hmm. but still having friends and brothers that you can count on with similar shared interests that were wanting to do the same things. So, you know, I want to go on a motorcycle ride. I've got several other people that are like, cool, where are we going? We pack our bikes together. We're spending time on the road together. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's a, a big appeal to it for sure. And I know, like, you know, I, I get hit up by a lot of people on social media over the years. And I've had people say, oh, yeah, you know, I'd really like to uh, be in a club because I really am looking for brotherhood. I'm really looking for brotherhood. Um, but the caveat to that is. A lot of these guys, when I start asking questions, they don't have long term friends. They don't have people that they consider brother. And to me, that's somewhat of a red flag, too. I'm not saying big groups, but if you can go your whole life and not have a couple of good, solid friends you can depend on, there's likely some sort of issue with you as a person. Yeah. And I, and <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I don't mean that in a negative way, but what I do mean is the brotherhood in any motorcycle club is not a given. You don't just get given the patch and everyone's going to give you a hug and call your brother and treat you like their best friend. Right. Um, right, right. You know, it's still going to depend on you as a person and your indiv individuality and, and the type of guy you are and your morals and values. And if you went through your whole life without having lasting friendships, you've li likely burnt some bridges and, and the same thing could happen to you in club life. Right. So it's right, definitely right. not a given. It's a, it's an earned thing. But that's, you know, that's mainly what prospecting is for is a big part is earning and get to know everybody. And then just your time in the club, the more time you've been in and the more you get to know everybody and, the, you know, the experiences we've spent together, those types of things is what makes that brotherhood real. And then, you know, that's what other people see. And that's that allure, right? Is other people see us having fun, being tight knit, protecting each other, looking out for each other. Um, and that's what draws people in. All right. I'm going to, <clears throat> I'm going to take this in a different direction. And then we'll get back to the uh, the club. Um, you've been writing for in clubs for I don't know how many years. But I think two thousand and five ish. So okay, so twenty to, years. Give it yeah, take. close to 18, twenty. Yeah, yeah, twenty years. What uh, what was your first bike? 
Well, so I started on Vespas back in the <clears throat> punk rock days, little scooters. Oh, yeah. My first, my, <laughs> my first um, like actual motorcycle was an 1100 Shadow I had for about two months. Um, sold that and bought a 1200 Sportster. And then I started hanging out with the outsiders and they wouldn't let people ride Sportsters. In fact, you couldn't even <laughs> park it. You couldn't ride in the pack with them and you couldn't park your Sportster in front of the clubhouse. You had to park it across the street. Really? So, yeah. So we traded those back in pretty quick. And um, so I had an 06 night train that I bought in 05. Um, and that was my first big twin. Okay. Okay. And then what about uh, since then? Man, I've had 29 motorcycles since <laughs> over, over the years. So I've, I've pretty much had them all at this point. And uh, were they all Harley Davidsons or you get, went to different? The majority of them were probably Harley Davidsons. You know, I had a few, uh, I grew up in Oregon. So I had a few dual sports, like a Yamaha WR250 that I would take like trail riding um, at a Versus. I, I sold metric bikes when I was in graduate school. So, I, you know, I just love motorcycles, all motorcycles. So I, I've had a few sport bikes and, um, you know, different stuff. But for the most part, yeah, they've probably only been Harleys. You never tried Indian or Buell or any other American made bikes? I had a Buell. I had the 1125R when it came out, which was when they switched from the Sportster motor to that Rotax motor. It was mm -hmm. their race one. That thing was sick. I, I had a great time on that bike. But it was more of a their sport, sportier looking one, more of the race looking bikes. I've never had an Indian. Um and and even in metric bikes, I don't think other than that very first Honda I had, I've never had like a metric cruiser. I figured if I was gonna have a cruiser, I'd just get a Harley. And and the right. reason I liked some of those other brands is because it was stuff that Harley wasn't making, you know. Right, 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 right. One more bike question, and then we'll get back to uh, you know, your life and whatnot. What do you think about this super cruiser that's coming out from Buell? Everybody's I think talking it's about sick, it. man. I think it's badass. I, I you know, I've I've had two FXRs growing up um fxrs and dinos were, have always been kind of my style of bike like i said i've had a buell that actually had that same motor in it but it was a smaller version um i, I think it's sick i think my concern for it would be since there's no like buell dealerships is what dealer support's going to be like if there's well you know ma maintenance you know you know how most time now if you want to have your warranty you have to get the maintenance done at the dealership versus doing right. it yourself um if there's recalls or you know stuff like that i would just be concerned to like who who's going to take care of that type of stuff or how that i just i guess how that would work Right. Um, but I think the idea of that bike is sick. It looks like the old school FXRs, you know, it's got a lot, little sportier stance. It's got a huge motor in it. It's lightweight. I mean, I think that's what every, it's what everyone wants right now, right? It's what everyone's yeah. spending big money into building. Yeah, absolutely. I, I messaged you during the week and I asked you, what do you think about putting a turbo on my, on my, yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. on my, uh, uh, breakout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah because I think that buell is like 175 horsepower or something yeah, it's like, that, like insane it? yeah it's, it's crazy it's, it's, yeah i know absolutely but that, they want some big money for it. it's like over 20 grand from what i understand yeah but the hard <laughs> yes i agree but i also think all new motorcycles are over 20 grand and they're pretty yeah yeah that's now. true you that's know? true that's true I, I think for that for what they built in that price point i was actually shocked that it wasn't more and i, I still think it's expensive but just in the way the market is i'm surprised it wasn't more because you, know, you want to buy a built FXR or Diner, an old one even, or if you want to get one of the new soft tails, you know, like the Lowrider ST or you know one of those popular models, you're still looking in, in the 20s, you know. Yeah, or, you're 100% so. right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's get back to uh, Club Life. Maybe we'll talk about bikes again. But when you were in the Mongols, you said you actually were in a leadership role on a national level. Um, how long did it take you to get there? And um, how? what kind of steps were there? So, you know, because there was no other chapters in Oregon when I started, um, I was elected the chapter P. So I was a chapter president. Um, but, you know, I was pretty inexperienced as a young kid. It was just because I, we were the ones that started it. Right. So mm -hmm. I kind of learned as I went there for quite a while. Um, in 2008, after I'd gotten out of jail and I was put on I was put on non-association, so I wasn't allowed to hang out with the club. And I knew I was going to keep doing it. And every time I violated, I kept going back to jail. So um I absconded from my probation and moved to San Diego because my mentor in the club at the time, he was a president of the San Diego chapter. So I figured, well, if I want to learn how to be a good leader and learn how to be the best Mongol I can be, the best place to do it's going to be Southern California. That's where all the Mongols are. That's, you know, I, I essentially being in Oregon felt like I was in a satellite chapter, at, you know, early on because mm -hmm. there'd be six or eight of us in the whole state where California would be 800, you know? So, right, 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 right. Yeah. So I moved down there and just kind of learned a lot. I was in, um, uh, just as a regular member when I was there, I wasn't in any officer positions the first time I was there. I did go back to California when I was uh, doing my undergrad at Whittier College. And that's when I first got brought into Mother Chapter, which is the national leadership. When mm -hmm. I first got brought in, I was not brought in as a leadership position. It was just mainly like as a soldier. So I'd help out with security, you know, I'd follow the officers around. I could have input in in the 
in the national club meet, you know, in the motor chapter meetings and stuff, but I didn't hold any sort of position. And then sometime around that time, and I, I talk about this a bit in my book too. So the, the club started expanding quite a bit over the years and, you know, they were kind of learning as they grow what's working with expansion and what's not. Um, and one of the things that I've always been pushing, like I was saying earlier, is that the club runs as one whole unit. So if, if a guy in Utah has a certain rule that has the same rule should be in California, or if California brothers doing this, the Florida guy, you should be able to pick up and go to any state and the rules and regulations should all be the same, right? We're right. supposed to be the same club. So everyone should be acting the same. And what was difficult in the early years was like in Oregon, for example, we had, uh, you know, someone that would oversee the state. So they're, you know, they weren't necessarily like the title wasn't boss or anything, but they were, you know, they're representative of mother chapter and their job was to make sure things were going smooth, be there. If you have any questions, make sure that everyone's following the protocol. Um, and most of the time early on, that guy was from California and what okay. we had learned or what, what we were starting to kind of see was, you know, a guy from California doesn't necessarily understand the local club politics in Oregon. There's clubs in Oregon that aren't in California. There's clubs in Oregon that these California brothers have never even heard of. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also, you know, a bunch of members in the state that unless you're coming and visiting often, you don't even know who's where or where, you know what I'm saying? Like the logistics of it. And I think the downside to that, other than that stuff too, was if you were, if, if there was a member that was just kind of the squeaky wheel or wanted, wanted, you know, position of power just to get the attention. And he was in that guy's ear often. That's what they hear is going on where they're, cause they're not physically there seeing how the things are working. Mm -hmm. So um, me and Lil Dave, who was the national P at the time, we developed what we called the state representative program, or at the time it was called the regional representative program. And, and the, the point of that was there should be someone with club experience, you know, chapter club Mongol experience that have been in for a while that knows history, but also knows protocol procedures. That's actually boots on the ground in the area. So um, I got brought in as a Northwest regional rep. So I over oversaw Oregon and Washington. So like, you know, I helped with expansion. I helped, you know, teach chapters how to run the right way, making sure that everyone was, if there was an event, everyone was going, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that type of stuff. Um, and that, I want to say it was 2011 or 12. And that's when I got like officially was kind of international leadership then, because I, from there, I ended up helping oversee all the, I helped start Australia chapters. So I helped oversee. Really? Australia. Wow. Impressive. And then, yeah. And that, um, we'll jump right back to that in a second, because that's pretty a quick, cool, cool story. But okay. I oversaw, um, you know, all the, pretty much all the out of country chapters there for a little while. It was I was the go between between them and mother chapter. I was the one trying to make sure they were following the rules. Um, and, and so I was I did that quite a bit. And then when I moved out to the Midwest, um, there was about two Mongols in. Well, there was two Mongols left in Kansas City, no chapters otherwise in Missouri in in illinois and not in tennessee and one chapter in indiana so i came out here and started a lot of chapters there's four in missouri two in illinois or three in missouri two in illinois three or four in indiana and one in tennessee since you know i had been out here and so then i i became you know then i started overseeing the midwest so i kind of always once we started that program I kind of was always in some sort of position where I was helping chapters start, helping teach people the protocol and the program, being the middleman between mother chapter and them, um, you know, making sure guys are being active, going to events, stuff like that. So I'd been doing that since I, I want to say it was 2012 ish. Wow. That's actually impressive. So yeah. Tell me the story about the, about Australia. Yeah. So back when I was a Vago, I want to say this was probably the MySpace days just to date everybody. Yeah. Um, God. But there's a, club, a really big club in Australia called the Finks, one of the biggest clubs in Australia. Um, and I don't know how the connection started, but there was a couple guys from the Finks that I was talking to back and forth. Just, you know, another motorcycle club. I was a 25 or 26 year old kid. So I was just want to meet people and talk. So I, was, I started getting pretty close to a lot of them. And one of them had gotten um, in a shootout at a kickboxing match. It was called the Ballroom Blitz. It was like pretty big in the in the media back then in Australia, because he he had shot a guy had left the Finks and joined the Hells Angels. So the Finks were attacking him and, and he had shot this guy at this wow. kickboxing match. And they were saying, hey, you know, we're looking for people to ride him. He's locked up. Just want to keep, you know, and because I was a new Vago, I was also would sit down and write the Vagos that were in prison. So I had a list of people that I would write in prison, introduce myself, get to know each other. Um, you know, I wanted to be the best member I could and talk to as many people as I could. And so I added this dude to my to my to my list. And then we started getting to know each other. We were talking a lot back and forth. So he was telling other Finks about me. And so the ones I became friends with, 
I didn't know this at the time, but they were ended up being the national bosses of this Finks club. So they were like the main players in the Finks. Really? And so there became a time when Australia, I'm sure everyone's heard about it. You know, our Australia made all these crazy laws where pretty much it's illegal to wear it. We're different states in Australia, but it was illegal to wear your patch and you couldn't hang out with each other. And if your club's considered a organized crime, we couldn't, you'd get arrested for hanging out with each other. And so I think they were trying to find a way maybe to skirt that and make some changes. And they were kind of considering maybe starting a new club or whatever, but because of my rela- their relationship with me, they brought up the idea of joining the Mongols. And so I put them in touch with mother chapter and we worked out the details and the Mongols before that had one small chapter in Australia. I think they had five members to being the biggest club in Australia after wow, that. Wow, really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's, that's actually really impressive. Yeah. And, and then, you know, those Australian guys, since they came from another major club and they've been there a long time, they have a lot of connections in the club world. So they help start like Thailand and Malaysia. And, you know, that wow. they, they, a lot of the growth we have over there was started after Australia because of Australia. How, do, how does how does the leadership keep up with so many chapters globally? I mean, it's almost like a Fortune 500 company. Yeah. And see, that's that's the part about learning as we grow. That's what. um you know, that's why we developed a state rep program just for the United States alone was that same issue. Like how, how is uh, someone in, in leadership in Los Angeles going to know what's going on in New York, you know? Right, right, right. Um, so that's why we became up that state rep program. And it's essentially, we do similar stuff out of country. There's like Australia has their own leadership, but then they also answer to the mother chapter here. Um, so you have to kind of trust the leadership there. We, you know, we, I, we, I couldn't get into Australia because my criminal record, plus you can't normally go if you're a known club member or gang member, they can't get in here. So we would do meetings in like Bali, um, Thailand. We, well, I did Thailand with them, Mexico. So we would find places to meet up once or twice a year to all be on the same page. And so just communication was a big piece. Wow. That's actually really, definitely, really definitely something like a learning as you grow type of thing for sure. Yeah. That's unbelievable. How many countries are the Mongols in? Uh, man, I'm not sure now. So when I took over overseeing out of state or out of country, Australia, there was a guy in Australia that had started some unauthorized chapters and we we're trying to figure out which were good, which weren't good, who should stick around, who shouldn't. And Germany's always been a big area for the Mongols. They've been there for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Um, Canada's opened up twice, but never made it. There was guys in Italy, but once we closed them down, they just started counterfeiting patches and still acting like Mongols. And there wasn't a lot we could do from here, you know? Wow. Um, and then there was a, a small chapter in England, uh, there was a small chapter in France. I think I, I know they have chapters in Ireland now, um, but you know I'm not up, up to date with it necessarily. Mm-hmm. But I do know, like when I was overseeing Europe, there was only a few chapters and they were pretty spread out, and it wasn't necessarily a good look, right? Because here, you know, these other clubs are big outlaws or angels or banditos are are big in that area, and we've got like four or five guys and. and spread out. So you don't even see them out and about. It's more, it was like on paper, we were there. So we really started going through and saying, okay, which, which ones are active, have good reputations or following, you know, doing the way that we do things. Um, and the ones that weren't, we ended up shutting down like Brazil, for example, they were, they had started out with like 20 guys and they were down to like three Ooh. and, and they had moved um, to San Paulo. And I, I know the guys wanted it and I, you know, I feel bad that we shut it down, but they just, they weren't making it, you know? Right, right, right. right, and, it, right. and if they're not going to make it and another club attacks them or something like that, that reflects on all of us. So we ended up shutting a lot of, a lot of chapters down um, because they weren't being run properly or, or, you know, didn't have the proper insight or the good insight or enough, enough people in it. Mm-hmm. In, in fact, there was a, um, a chapter in England where it turned out that their president had used, had come from the Hells Angels, which isn't, you know, you can't go from the Hells Angels to the Mongols. It's pretty, probably all. Well, <laughs> probably obvious reasons. Really? How did that happen? Well, so I'm not quite sure because somehow <laughs> we didn't, we were unaware of this. And so, and it wasn't just that he used to be a hell's angel. He had been involved in a pretty violent um, altercation when he was a hell's angel with the outlaws. And I don't remember if an outlaw had been killed or just severely injured, but the outlaws obviously had beef with this guy. And at the time we were really close with the outlaws. So they were essentially, they're the ones that told us about it. Hey, you know, this guy, he used to be Hell's Angel and not just that we have beef with him and he's kind of using your club for protection type of deal. Wow. So, I, you know, I get on the phone with these guys or we're sending emails and I'm saying, Hey, you know, I know you guys care about this guy, but he, we have rules against this. He, sh- he shouldn't have been let in in the first place. He can't be in the club. And they just started telling me that, okay, yeah, he's out. He's not in. But like I said, there's always some squeaky wheel that wants to impress leadership. There's always someone's going to tell, right? 
yeah. was getting pictures of, well, this guy's still in. They were just trying to hide it from us. Yeah. Um, and that's really, I think that was an eye-opening. That's, we did shut that chapter down, but it was an eye-opening experience to us too is how are we going to do this? Like, how are we going to oversee areas where something like England, okay, they're going to decide they don't want to follow our rules. What are we going to do? Pack up, get on a plane and go out there? Like, there's not a lot we can do in a lot of situations. Right, right, right. Um, so, so a lot of that governing the out of country stuff is, is still in process. It's gotten better because essentially what they do, like I said, Germany has been around a long time and does a good job. So they'll help oversee certain parts or Australia's big and strong. So they'll help oversee other parts. Um, so as long as there's chap, bigger chapters that you can trust out there, then, then we'll have, you know, we can still maintain leadership. Okay. Um, <clears throat> since you brought up, uh, the angels and if you don't want to speak about this, you don't have to. Um, when you were a Mongol, were there any, were there any serious run-ins? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, not, maybe not necessarily, per- well, not a lot of personal ones, but it, it happened on a regular basis somewhere for sure. Um, mm-hmm. a lot of Mongols have been killed by Hell's Angels. A lot of Mongols I was close with were killed by, well, a few, some of the younger m- members that I was close with were killed by Hell's Angels. Um, but it was definitely, uh, always a pretty hot thing. Yeah, it, it seems that the Mongols and the Angels kind of always had this this run in. Has there ever been has there ever been voice of reasons from both sides that said, "Hey, look, you know, yeah, l- let's end this. This is ridiculous. We're just killing each other. This is years of of beef that's going back, and we don't even know why we don't like each other." Yeah, absolutely. There was, you know, there's times when newer members will join, and you know, they're f f the Angels or f the Mongols, and they have no idea why, right? Um, the argument to that obviously is once you've been in long enough, you'd likely lose a brother to one of them. And then it's, then you're now, now you get it right. You're, you're on yeah. board. Um, right, right, right. But yeah, no, definitely there was, I can't remember the exact year, but there was a time, let's say 2010, 2011, sometime around then um, where the two clubs started meeting and talking about initially it started with just a stand down ceasefire. Everyone ignore each other. Um, but try, I don't think anyone ever assumed we were going to be friends, but we were trying to get to the point where we could coexist. Um, a lot of people were dying and going to prison over the years and it was, it's not beneficial to either club. Um, and there were some voices of reason on both sides that were really pushing it and wanted it. I think the big issue or the problem for, at least from my, my personal experience, why it didn't seem to work is leadership differences where the Mongols are a top-down leadership national president says hey we're cool with with the angels hands off if you violate that rule you're going to get disciplined right where the angels don't have national leadership from what i understand they're you know it's they're a one man one vote so every chapter is can do their own thing essentially ah okay. so when we would have these meetings they'd say okay well we're cool here here and here but still haven't worked it out here here and here um and the mongols don't work like that you know we mm-hmm. might be cool in los angeles but if you put hands on one of us in arizona now we're not cool in los angeles either uh, so getting everyone on the same page ended up being the challenge. And I think the reason it didn't work out, but there has been some times it's been tried. Okay. Okay. What if would have been the biggest allies for the Mongols? What which clubs? It probably depends on the generation. Um, like when I when I joined, um, the Mongols were getting really tight with the pagans. The pagans were helping the Mongols with their East Coast expansion. And when I say helping, I I don't mean like giving them members or anything, but they were just allowing them to start in their areas, stuff like that. Um, And they spent a lot of time together as party party together. So for a while, the Mongols and pagans had had a really good rapport. I believe they still do, but like I said, I'm not in anymore. So I couldn't say that stuff changes (laughs) on and off. Even then, like I said, the Mongols were really tight with the pagans and there was a year or so that they weren't. And then they were again. Um, But the pagans have always been a pretty big ally. And then for a long time, the outlaws were, allies of the mongols they were they were you know both used to have issues with the angels they're both black and white clubs i know mm-hmm. my history with the outlaws is some of their their leadership were guys that were big in the punk rock and hardcore scene back when i was so we already knew each other or knew of each other um so we kind of already had a really close friendship so that also helped build the club's friendship mm-hmm. but even before me the clubs were hanging out spending time together um that you know not necessarily like a brotherhood club but they all coexisted they were friends hung out together um and that was for many for many many years the problem and then the, we like when i was in the northwest we were always super cool with the banditos anytime i'd visit texas they'd take care of us um so i i think uh, mainly other than the angels for the most part the models used to get along with pretty much everybody yeah um, it seems strange because i mean it's basically everybody wants to do the same thing 
ride motorcycles, have a good time, hang out with your boys, get laid. That's pretty much it. You would think everybody would be cool with each other. <laughs> you would. The, the problem I've seen is it firsthand is it's just ego. So I'll, ego and, and some disrespect to an extent as well, where in the early years, every club had their own area, right? Te Texas was bandits, you know, Southern California was Mongols and so on. And in this, this new day and age of bikers or, or motorcycle clubs, everybody's going everywhere. Mm. And, and it ends up stepping on toes or, or violating agreements. And then clubs we've been friends with forever are no longer friends because we've started a chapter in their state without their permission or in, in their area without their permission. Um, and, and, you know, Law enforcement comes up with some bullshit narrative that it's because it's about you know power and control of money and organized crime and stupid shit. But I, I know firsthand that's not a fact. It's mm -hmm. actually the sad fact is it's just ego. Nobody's mm -hmm. nobody's losing money over it. It's not really affecting anybody. Um, I've started a lot of chapters in other clubs areas and, and you know, I always try to do it with their permission when I could. But even not what I would always tell them is, you know, with all due respect, we don't attract the same type of members because we're a different club. You know, we have. The Mongols have a different look than this club or that club. So the type of people that come to us are probably not people that we're taking out of your pool. We don't take each other's ex members. We would, you know, everyone kind of had their own bar, their own area. So we weren't really stepping on toes. So I, th I think uh, a rational mind can see cordial coexistence for sure. But I think there's a lot of ego and older generations that were, this is our area and they can't be here. And, you know, like I said, if you touch one, then you have an issue everywhere. So might right. be cool with one club all over. And then there's an issue in Florida and all of a sudden we're not cool anymore. So the, and then, you know, I, I don't want to get super deep into this, but I will say in the last couple of years, what I have seen is it used to be most clubs di didn't get along with the angels and everyone liked the Mongols. And now all these clubs are aligning with, with each other or with angels because of pagan and Mongol expansion so like these other major clubs are working together to try and keep Mongols and pagans out. So it just really? shifts, I guess, politically it shifts depending on who's in charge, who's moving where, um, what clubs are friends with what. I, it, I tell you one thing, it's uh, it's extremely interesting. Um, and I could see why people are enamored by it. And if you, if you notice all the uh, biker documentaries are on Sundays, right. I guess because, because guys are home and they like watch all the, all the biker documentaries and mafia documentaries are on Sundays. I'm only going to ask you a couple more questions and they're going to be pretty relatively, uh, you know, simple. And then I'll, I'll let you go. Cause I don't want to keep up too much of your time. Yeah, no problem. Man. Nationality. Everybody thinks bikers are all white. Is that accurate or no? No, not at all. And especially nowadays. <laughs> um, I don't know. There's a, a Instagram page called outlaw archives. If you guys are interested in like biker history and stuff, definitely check it out. But he, you know, he collects old school biker artifacts, photos, history, and he, he knows all the history of it. And he's even pointed out the fact that, you know, in the 60s and 70s, the Angels had a couple black members. They've always had his some Hispanic members, um, some Asian members. So but yes, historically, everyone thinks it's, you know, it's it's a white it's a white man's thing. And, you know, it's it's American. Right. So there's that big piece. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, I, I, I couldn't tell you when the rule started, but I know early on almost every major club had a rule that that blacks can't join. And so then that became that it's all whites, but mm -hmm. you know, the, everyone knows that the Mongols are primarily Hispanic. There's a lot of Hispanics in the Vagos. That's right. I've met a lot of Hispanics in the outlaws. There's a lot of Hispanics in the angels. So, I mean, and the banditos, obviously. Yeah. Well, and, well, <laughs> the banditos are wider than you would think actually. Really? It's, well, it, it te it's Texas, right? So South Texas is Hispanic and the rest are white, but outside of Texas, wow. a lot of banditos are, are white. Um, so I think there's a mix in all clubs. The big, the difference I see now is there's likely black members in clubs, but they're not openly talking about it. Like it's normally like, oh, he he's Puerto Rican or he's, <laughs> he's Dominican. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that to talk shit by any means, but I'm saying that that people are going on a case by case basis. But I would say. Um, you know, as far as the black thing goes, I know the way it was explained to me is it comes down to the United States prison politics. You know, if you're going to be, you say you're an angel or a Mongol and you go to, go to the pit and to the joint, you want to hang with your brothers. But if they're of a different race or nationality, then you really can't. So it would start issues there, mm. um, which makes sense to me, although I haven't been in prison, so I can't say that it, it just seems to make sense from what I've heard. Right, um, right. Well, it does make sense. The, yeah, Mo sure. the Mongols have black members in Australia. I've seen them. You know, there's quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. 
So I think it's more of an American thing. And I do definitely see it changing. I just think ego, like I said, ego plays a huge role in this world. And I think no one wants to be the first club to do it. Right, 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 you right. Okay. And, and that's my personal opinion. Um, because like I said, there there are black members in some of these major clubs, but they're just not identifying as being black members. Wow, that's 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 amazing. Okay. Now here's an, another myth, if you will, is that uh you can't leave once you're a member, you're a member forever. But you obviously were able to leave. How, is that how did you do it, or is that something that's just false? Yeah, it's just false, straight up false. I categorically false. I can't imagine. Maybe that was something back in the day, or maybe that's just because of, you know, mafia and gang type stuff. I mean, so people assume it's the same. Mm -hmm. um, every club I've ever been around, members quit all the time, are allowed to leave. Um, you know, and, and I'm every club kind of has a different way they deal with it, I suppose. You know, some clubs you could leave, and if you're in good standing, you can come back later. A lot of the smaller clubs will have a guy that's left and come back a couple times. Um and then they all have, you know, different rules about what constitutes what your status is when you leave. And, you know, it used to be the out bad designations were for someone that did something negative against the club, ratted, messed with a brother's old lady, stole from some, you know, like for, for the degenerates that shouldn't be in the club world, they'd mm. be put out in bad standings, which back then meant you couldn't affiliate with any club. No other club could take you and no one could have communication with you. Um, you know, nowadays, like the, the Mongols lost a lot of members after Black Rain in 2008. So they had a they made up a rule of if you haven't been in for more than 10 years, you can't if you leave the club, no matter what reason, you're automatically out bad. So then there's guys that, OK, they're out in bad standings, you can't talk to them, but no one's at, there's no ill will. No one's trying to do anything, you know, go out and get them. It's just they left before they were in long enough to be out in good standings. Mm -hmm. So there's just different caveats to it at this point. But I would tell you, I've you know, I helped a lot with the expansion. I brought a lot of people into this club and I've seen just as many people leave. Now, what is what was Black Rain? Black Rain was that big undercover um, operation that happened in 2008 when the Mongols had several undercover informant or act, undercover agents in their club. And then there was like a nationwide raids and racketeering charge. And really, yeah. And in fact, how it's some of it's still going on because that's when the government found a, a loophole or whatever where they tried to use, say, that the insignia was that they were able to take it. They were saying that they, that that they could take it due to like say they say they do a racketeering against a, a organization so, or a, a franchise like say McDonald's they might be able to take the logo because it's being used in concert for the franchise franchise so they tried that with the Mongols and it didn't work but it still it keeps you know it's been going on since 2008 cause it's been going to different appellate courts and back and forth and wow okay so it, it's it, it was a really big thing in in the Mongols and. You know, I joined in 2007, and I think I want to say probably around 2005 is when the leadership before that doc was in this really big recruitment drive. Mm -hmm. So he was bringing a lot of people in and a lot of states and a lot of people weren't prospecting. And um, so there was a lot of, you know, gung ho Mongols that once people's homes started getting raided and guys were going to prison or like, uh, you know what, this isn't what I signed up for. And, you know, it obviously rubbed the, those of the guys, or those of us that stayed the wrong way. So trying to come up with different rules on when you can leave, when you can't leave, what your status mm. is. Okay. A lot of times it's case by case, or at least it wasn't under my leadership. You know, if you're, if you're quitting because you're scared or you're a pussy, then yeah, you're going to be helped bad. If, if uh, you know, your, your, your old lady's sick and you got no one to take care of her and you don't, you can't put the time into the club, then we, why would we put you out in bed? So um, uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. There's always, you know, we could always figure, figure it out. It's pretty case by case, but to answer the easy answer is yes people leave and quit motorcycle clubs all the time with no issues no one's out looking for you um i mean if you listen if you left the club and you kept your patch and you're still representing it then yeah someone might want to beat you up i would, ima I would imagine right yeah but, that's different yeah. but if you're a respectful person and and you know you follow kind of the the protocol and the rules and and mind your own you don't stir the pot mm -hmm. I'm, sure, I'm sure that no one really cares do you uh do you miss it there's i miss some of the people I don't necessarily miss the lifestyle anymore. And I don't mean that negatively because I had a blast. I loved everything about it. Um, I just, like I said, it didn't really mess necessarily fit with my lifestyle anymore. And I will also say that I've been very blessed with the fact that I've got a group of guys in my area that left around the same time as me that I'm very, very tight with. And we ride together often. We do all the same, like we just rode to Texas and back. We do weekend rides. So all, all the positives I got out of club life, I still get. But I no longer have to deal with the politics, the negativity, 
um, the police harassment, you know, people, the, the backstabbing for, for politics, right. all of that stuff's gone. And now I just have a small group of friends that I ride with and party with. So um, because of that, I don't, there's not a lot I would miss. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Is it true? Jesse Ventura was a Mongol. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Not, <laughs> not for a super long time, but he was a Mongol in the San Diego chapter. His club name was Superman. He actually wrote the club's fight song um, or is credited for writing it at least. And, you know, he, he's his status is is retired in good standing so he still has his patch i've seen him wear club property on like different uh tv like interviews and stuff um i saw him at a uh one of the mongol anniversary parties national anniversary parties he was there wearing his really? patch. you have a picture of me and him on my instagram page it's like the most liked photo i've got on my <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome yeah you would never think you know back then the uh the wrestlers the wrestlers in the 70s 80s 90s they were legitimate tough guys oh for sure they were because you know they you know, first of all, you had to be right. And, but the, if you really did have a, a shoot back, uh, a shoot fight background or a wrestling background, or you didn't have anything else to go into, there was no mixed martial arts. There's no UFC, right. you yeah. know, the, the only thing was wrestling. So For you sure. really did like a lot of these guys were legitimate tough guys. Yep. Like, yeah. From what I heard, Jesse was- had left the Navy and was, had joined the Mongols and then left the Mongols to get into pro wrestling. So yeah. it was kind of in that interim there. Yeah, there was there was I, I believe there was a there was a promoter, a wrestling promoter in the seventies and eighties. I'm not a hundred percent sure what his name was, but it wasn't Vince McMahon. It was before he took over everything. And back then, it was like you know you didn't say it was fake, right? The the audience said it was fake. You said it was real. Right. Oh, you'd watch people get smacked for saying it was fake. I remember. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's that famous, there's that famous one where John Stossel got smacked. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, so the guys, you know, after after wrestling matches, they would go out and they would hang out, they'd go to the bar. You know, it wasn't like today where there's Netflix and video games. Oh and, no, they were rock stars, man. Yeah, they would go out, they would go and they would drink and they do drugs and have a good time. And then there was always like the local tough guys that would be like, Oh, you guys are fake, it's bullshit, it's fake wrestling. And the promote one of the promoters, I might it might have been Vern Gagne, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I might be I might be wrong. If you lost a ball fight, you got fired. You, you, you. <laughs> That's badass. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Because he, he, it was like it was so embedded in them that you have to make make sure that they the people believe that it's real. That yeah, if you lost the ball fight, you were gone. And a lot of these guys, they were nuts. I mean, they were they were just oh fucking... yeah, you hear like a lot of those old school stories, or you know, oh, even yeah. like I, guys like the rock that grew up around that stuff you hear his stories what you know just whatever you hear yeah. all these stories from back in the day and they said they were rock stars man they went put on their they put their, they abused their bodies but they they worked super hard for what they got and then and yeah. when they went out they, they went out and they went hard you know yeah they and it was no it was no fucking joke like a, there were a lot of legitimate tough guys so the fact that jesse ventura was a mongol doesn't surprise me i know um, I know when Hogan was in WCW and was NWO, he had like a pay per view where he had a bunch of angels leading him into the ring. Yeah, like they, Mel Chancey and the Chicago it, Hells Angels. So that's right. Mel's been uh, me and me and Mel actually connected recently since we're both out of club life and you know both have that shared experience of being in a club for a long time and in leadership and then leaving and doing different things with your life. So uh-huh. him and I have been getting pretty close and he's told me some of that. And then I've seen some of those interviews, but Mel was so big into the bodybuilding scene back in the day. Oh, he was a monster. And he was such a huge dude that, uh, yeah, he, he knew he met Hulk Hogan. He was, you know, he knew the rock. He, he knew a lot of those dudes back then just from bodybuilding. So what's funny is I remember hearing those stories of Hulk Hogan was a hell's angel or he knows hell's angels and all this stuff. Um, and now I know who it was. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Life yeah. works out. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's, I've been trying to get Mel Chancey on since I started my podcast three years ago and I'll, I'll message him on Instagram or Facebook and he does get back to me. He All never, the time. yeah, he will never ignore me. I'll just say, I can't do it right now. Whatever the yeah, case may a, be, whatever, he's blah, a blah, busy blah. Guy, man. He's oh, a busy I could guy. only, and he's, he's still he's, very much involved with bodybuilding. Been I think super, he has his own shows. He has his own shows, um, you know, a couple different businesses. He's just, he's absolutely a super busy guy, but he's been nothing short of, awesome and and cool to me so yeah yeah it was it was unbelievable so what is your life like now i know you're a social worker i know you're big into mixed martial arts and you're still writing you're married yeah what is it what's your what's your life like now that's what i'm doing so you know i i uh i I work monday through friday nine to five pretty much and then after work i'm either lifting weights or doing jujitsu depending on what day of the week it is Mm. and then uh the, the times i'm not doing that i'm with the boys riding motorcycles and 
being irresponsible and having a good time. So um, it, life's been great, man. I really can't complain. Things have been going awesome. I think that's maybe one of the reasons, like when you say, do you miss it? Um, there's aspects I miss, but I'm really happy with where I am in my life. You know, um, yeah. when, when I get some free time, I try and do my YouTube channel, which isn't super often, but I still do it. And, you know, mm -hmm. I did, uh, it was really fun working on this book and now I'm into trying to promote this book. So, you know, I, right. I stay, I stay busy, but I have a really good time. So the book, here it is. The Ride of My Life, a memoir, a, me a memoir, Justin Mooch DiLoretto. Where can we get this book? Uh, best way to do it's Amazon, just because that's where they like record rankings and, you know, all that type of stuff. So okay. just you can just put in The Ride of My Life or Mooch or whatever in Amazon. It'll pop up and I got hardback, paperback and Kindle version. I'm just about to start recording the audio version. So it'll eventually be on Audible. Um, but that's, that's pretty cool. That takes a little bit. So, yeah. Well, I'm going to make sure that the link of for Amazon is in the description when this is out. So you could just click and go buy it. Go buy it. It's a great book. We didn't even touch on what's in the book from this, you know, 45 minute, one hour interview. There's a hell of a lot more. Uh, Mooch is a great guy. Go out and support. Buy the book. You won't be disappointed. And Mooch, thank you again. Really. I really appreciate you coming on, man. Absolutely, it's man. A, it's been an it was honor. It a good time chopping it up with you. Thanks for having me back. Of course, brother. We'll talk soon. All right, bro. All right, later. Later.